Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new pair of Ace in the Day gameplays for the Arcade Mode War Thunder. In today's episode we shall be reviewing the Mitsubishi A6M2 Model 11 Raisin, a Japanese naval fighter coming at a tier of 2 and a battle rating of 3.3. To provide you a brief historical overview as to the origins behind the A6M Raisin and this particular iteration of it, we begin thus. Due to the obsolete nature of the Mitsubishi A5M by 1937, in terms of its open air cockpit, fixed landing gear and armament of two 7.7mm machine guns amongst other features, the Imperial Japanese Navy or the IJN issued specifications for a new fighter as of the 19th of May 1937. This would replace the IE5M which had interestingly just only entered service. The following requirements were to be met then a top speed of 600 km an hour or 370 miles per hour, a climb rate of reaching 3000 meters altitude or 9800 feet in three and a half minutes, with drop tanks and endurance of one and a half to two hours at normal rated engine power and six to eight hours at economical speeds, an armament of two 20 mm cannon and two 7.7 mm machine guns, provisions for two 60 kg bombs to be fitted, provisions for the mounting of a full radio set inside the aircraft and radio direction finder for long range navigation, a takeoff run of less than 70 meters or 230 feet in a 31 mile per hour or 50 km an hour headwind, maneuverability equal to its predecessor the A5M, a wingspan of less than 12 meters or 39 feet for deployment on an aircraft carrier, and finally only using engines in the design that were currently available to the Imperial Japanese Naval Air Force. Initially then the IJN issued the requirements to both Nakajima and Mitsubishi but Nakajima soon dropped out of this competition as they felt the design requirements were way too restrictive. Turning the page, Mitsubishi's design, led by Jiro Hirokoshi, was a smoothly contoured monoplane fighter, with a fully enclosed cockpit and fully retractable landing gear, but the plane lacked armour protection or self-sealing fuel tanks, allowing it to meet the requirements. Designated the A6M1, the initial prototype was an all-metal airframe powered by a 780 horsepower Mitsubishi Suisei 13 radial engine. It flew for the first time as the 1st of April 1939, meeting all of the requirements excluding the top speed requirement of 600 km an hour, falling closer to 500 km an hour instead. During further flight testing, the engine was replaced by the more powerful and newly available 925 horsepower Nakajima Sake 12 radial engine, and this was as of the third prototype, which would be redesignated the A6M2. Based on the success of these trials, the fighter was adopted as the A6M Raisin Type 0 fighter for the IJN as of September 14th, 1939, entering production for further combat trials, and in combat it would be armed with two 20mm Type 99 Mark I cannon, with 60 rounds per gun and one mounted to each wing, and two 7.7mm Type 97 machine guns mounted in the engine cowling with 500 rounds per gun. As of July 1940 then, the A6M2 was to prove itself in the Second Sino-Japanese War, with 15 A6M2s being deployed, shooting down a total of 99 Chinese aircraft for only two lost. Based on this combat trial, the A6M2 Type 0 Model 11 was ordered by the IJN into production as a carrier fighter. Hence the A6M2 Model 11, as depicted on your screen today, was the first carrier-borne variant of the A6M. From the 66 aircraft onwards, a number of modifications were introduced. Most importantly, the manually folding wingtips were added in order to allow the A6M2 to fit more easily onto aircraft carriers, and these planes with the modification were redesignated as the A6M2 Type 0 Model 21 Raisin. The successor to this aircraft in War Thunder, a review of which we have already provided, and you may see using the link in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. But, by the start of Pearl Harbor, either 7th December 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy had 328 A6M2s in operational service, including the 65 A6M2 Model 11s. And with our historical overview concluded, let us take a look at how the A6M2 Mod 11 handles in War Thunder's arcade mode. For our first game of today, we're on the ground strike map Caucasus using the following setup. Stealth belts are our 7.7mm machine guns, Reasoning being that whilst these belts are the most powerful belts available to our 7.7s, more importantly these belts are devoid of any tracer, meaning that we can focus on the tracers of our tracer belts in our 20mm cannon. 
whereby these consist of only high explosive fragmentation tracer rounds, with the high explosive fragmentation component allowing us to cut apart enemy fighters and bombers alike, with the ability to knock apart the enemy fuselage, or alternatively take out their pilot quite nicely, through sustained fire that is. And the tracer component of these belts allows us to see where our rounds are going, as the ballistics of the 20mm Type 99 Mark I cannon can be quite difficult to get used to at first especially seeing as our rate of fire is 520 rounds per minute and we only have 60 rounds per cannon, meaning that we can exhaust all of our ammunition before we can even get a clean shot. And with a muzzle velocity of 600 meters per second, this can be quite low compared to what you may be used to in the British and German equivalents. As for our gun convergence, we are using a 400 meter gun convergence, as whilst we are predominantly a turn fighter, or well, that is our overall strategy. Every so often we will need to move into a boom and zoom capability or even a bomber interceptor role and we will need a convergence which allows us to apply all three roles in good fashion and 400 meters will do that. And finally for our fuel load we are using the standard 30 minute fuel load to make it to the end of the game unscathed on fuel capacity. Now some of you may be wondering at this point, well why bomber interceptor and indeed why boom and zoom? Well hopefully this first game is going to demonstrate the A6M2 Mod 11 in a bomber interceptor role, or at least to the first 50%. Now we're at 4100 meters altitude and climbing, and we can see that the enemy team has a large number of rather heavy bombers, including the PE-8 just above us. But before we go after them, we must take out the A6M2 Mod 21 that is climbing underneath us. Whereby we are diving down on them now, and we're going to take them apart as they gradually begin to stall out. Now the two planes in terms of their flight models are practically identical, I've yet to identify a difference between the two. Meaning that what applies here for the A6M2 Mod 11 also applies for the A6M2 Mod 21. And as we break away from picking up our first kill, we can see that the PE-8 is on the beam to us and we will be coming up from underneath. There is a blind spot to their 20mm cannon turrets in this position and we are going to exploit it, coming up underneath them and sustaining our fire with our remaining 90 20mm cannon rounds. We make our way over, and we start to line up our pass, and we start to climb. Zooming in to make sure we can be as accurate as possible, and we will be correcting our shots when we start to miss our 20mm cannon rounds thanks to the tracers available, and we can see them here impacting on the fuselage of the P8 as we cut them apart for our second kill and only take a small smattering of return fire. We now break down going for a reload, begin to bring our nose up once again to counter any other threats. With our vicinity clear, we notice a PBY off in the distance being harassed by our friendly P400 and we are going to help out. We must also consider that the P39N Aero Cobra on our team gave their life to bring down the enemy B7A2 that was climbing us at the start of the match, and we're going to look over to confirm the parachutes from the two aircraft very shortly, as we do now. So. Why Bomber Interceptor? This is really odd for a turn fighter, or at least a plane that would be commonly labelled as a turn fighter. Well, for your battery rating and tier, one has to consider that at a tier of 2 and a battery rating of 3.3, you have a number of medium and heavy bombers available to you, or at least when plus or minus 1.0 of that battle rating. Such as the PE-8, the Year 2 M105, the Heinkel 111, you get the picture. So as a result, a number of bomber pilots or players with bombers available will bring those out to try and get them fully spaded, and we need to counter this. As we come up underneath our PBY-5 Catalina on the tail here, and put in a good portion of our 20mm cannon rounds, picking up a critical hit, knocking out their tail control, and only taking a small amount of return fire once again. And this time we can see that the return fire has impacted our tail section, although not to compromise our tail control surfaces. So we need to help in countering the threat of enemy bombers in ground strike games in particular, and we are doing so right now. As our overall performance, whilst not that of an interceptor, is good enough to enable us to do so. Although we have to exploit blind spots on enemy bombers, and we've been doing this so far, taking the minimum amount of return fire, as our durability and overall flammability are rather weak. If we take a good amount of fire from an enemy fighter or bomber, whether it be from machine gun fire or alternatively cannon fire, we should expect this plane to be ripped to pieces. Even the most smallest of bursts from a 20mm cannon on the likes of a Spitfire Mark IIb, if it strikes rather control surfaces, will most likely compromise that control surface quite easily. We only need to take a glance in blow, for example, in order to have our ability to use our elevator cut in half. And at the same time, if we do take hits from incendiary rounds, due to the lack of any armour protection and the lack of self sealing fuel tanks, it is very likely we will be set on fire and burned to death unless the fuel tanks run out of fuel in the first place. 
Now we come onto the beam here of the Year 2 M105 to cut them apart, another blind spot for their side turrets, if they have any, and pick up our third kill. And we can see how the high explosive fragmentation commands of our 20mm cannon belt rounds are very effective even against the more heavily armed and armoured bombers. And we drop down here on a Focke-Wulf 200 Condor, and unfortunately we cannot quite get our rounds to work there. But nonetheless we should not be discouraged and we break back up. Having done a good amount of damage to the Condor, meaning it is very likely that they will get ripped apart by one of our friendly interceptors, or alternatively they may see themselves as needing to dive down to lower altitude to hit their targets. And now we pick on an A6M2 Model 11 who is trying to stall climb. I believe it may be the same pilot as earlier in the A6M2 Model 21, and we're going to make sure they cannot get to altitude as we pick up an assist on the Condor. We open fire at roughly 250 meters and cut them apart for our fourth kill. And as we break back towards friendly territory, we see as another year two has spawned in and we need to knock them out straight away. As if they can drop their 400 kilogram bomb load, if they have the maximum bomb load available, they are going to knock out bases and our airfield very rapidly. We can see here we can climb very nicely, we can climb over longer periods, and we can get well into range of the year two on their underside where they have no defensive armament and cut them apart for our race and day. Now here we're going to transition into more of a boom and zoom role before moving back into a turn fighter role, but this is going to take time. As we go into our dive, note a couple of things. Firstly, our maximum dive speed would not exceed typically more than 750 km an hour, i.e. it is very difficult to get above this speed in general. Plus, our control surfaces do become locked up quite significantly when we go into high speed dives, but only in a couple control surfaces, not the rudder. Your rudder is incredibly consistent even at the highest of speeds, as we max out our dive here at 730 km an hour. Meanwhile, your roll rate begins to lock up at 475 km an hour, with this roll rate lock up maximising by the time you hit 600, with your roll rate dropping to roughly 20% of that which is standard to your aircraft. We come onto the back here of a MiG-3 15BK to pick them off for our sixth kill, and with the critical damage we have done to the other MiG-3 that crossed our path, we are expecting to pick up an assist at the minimum. And as for the elevator, well, the nose up elevator response, I pull in the plane up, remains consistent in the midst of a dive, perhaps dropping only roughly 20% of your standard output. Meanwhile, trying to go nose down, I pushing your nose down in the midst of a dive. This locks up to almost its entirety, as we saw against the Focke-Wulf 200 Condor when we tried to push our nose down to get a cleaner shot onto them. So we need to be wary of this. And as we now make our way along in friendly territory at roughly 1,300 meters altitude, we decide to climb once again, as we can see that the threat of enemy ground attackers has resurged, where Junkers 87 and Su-2 appearing along with an unidentified bomber in the background, soon identified as an A-20G Havoc. We also have to consider that there is an SPT Dauntless over towards our base in the northwest corner of the map, gradually knocking the base out, and that is what we are going to go after next, whereby we can react to the presence of targets at distance quite rapidly and make our way over there. The SPD being unhindered so far, we are going to change that. So we are going to a gradual dive once again, and we are going to see how our control surfaces with regards to the run rate and the negative elevator response will begin to lock up again as we drop down below 2000 meters altitude, and we intend to cut the Dauntless apart in a single pass, if not a second one by coming around quickly on our turn circle. We make our way in here, and we pick up the kill on the MiG-3 from earlier, the first one we hit on our boom and zoom pass, and damage their control surfaces in the tail. And we make sure not to come directly behind the Dauntless to avoid return fire from their top gunner, put in a good number of hits here, and kill them off for our 8th kill. Our 8th kill I should say. With the Dauntless down now we make our way back towards the centre of the map and we hope to make our role more of a turn fighter role now as the enemy bomber and attacker threat has been eliminated. So hopefully we have demonstrated so far how the A6M2 Mod 11 can be used in that bomber interceptor role, and more of a boom and zoom capability if needs be as we saw on the two MiG-3s. Although we have to keep in mind that our opponents were flying in straight lines and were not aware of our presence, and this is going to be ideal for you to use this plane as a boom and zoom aircraft as if they do make a sudden turn or a sudden response from other control surfaces to try and evade your fire, the lack of controllability in your roll rate in particular will typically mean that your opponents will be able to avoid your fire unscathed unless you try to predict their motion well in advance. We react to the Yak-7 cutting underneath us here by making a very tight turn over the top of them, instead of going for the split test which would have taken more time due to our locked up roll rate. We now begin to pursue the Yak-7B but we can see here as they bring their nose up they are starting to get away as we do not have the ability to pick up as much speed in the dive, nor conserve it. Fortunately for us, the Yak-7B really starts to lift their nose up to guard off for any P-400, 
and we put in a lot of ammunition here, but unfortunately due to the low muzzle velocity of our 20mm cannon, we miss a good portion of our shots, even at our set convergence, so we can only pick up the assist. But our intentions were true. And we're P47 Thunderbolt also coming in now, we reload our 20mm cannon once again, and begin to move into the fight. Also noticing the MiG-3 coming in, so we decide to wait and see what exactly happens, who goes for who. The P-47 is going for our Sunderland, a Yak-7 is trying to hit the P-47 and the Yak-7 is being attacked by the MiG-3. Although the MiG now comes onto us and glances us with their forward facing 12.7mm machine guns, sorry, machine gun or their 7.7mm machine guns. As we break our way around here, we come onto the back of the MiG, but they have multiple foes on them so we decide to hold back. By foes I mean friendlies here. And we notice that our three friendlies cannot get a clean shot, so we use our tight turn circle and overall maneuverability to come up, but we switch to a Dornier 217N2 very quickly, just put in a couple of rounds, and then opening fire once again, try to push them away. And they soon begin to turn around here, reacting to our presence most likely, knowing that they will not be able to get away from us, or at least assuming that. And we now break over the top of the MiG-3 here, before switching back to Dornier, keeping our eyes on both foes. This is going to be very important when in the midst of a furball that we need good awareness of what is going on at all times. We switch to the MiG-315 here, having picked up an assist on the Dornier, opening up our machine guns, doing a little bit more scratch damage. We can see the difference here between our machine guns and our 20mm cannon, as the MiG-3 climbs with a friendly Yak-7, whereby we are going to be relying on our 20mm cannon to do the damage. And having reloaded our cannon, we evade the head-on pass on IL-2-1942, using our great overall maneuverability, and knock out that tail control. Unfortunately, we do not get the kill as the game comes to its end, and we must now consider our post-game stats. With our 8 kills and 4 assists, we are able to pick up 21,706 silver lines and 1,727 research points. So hopefully through this first gameplay, we have broken the stereotype that all zeros are made for turn fighting and that alone. Whereby in this case we employed our A6M2 Model 11 in a number of roles, starting first and foremost with Bomber Interceptor to help bring down some of the more heavily armed and armoured bombers at our battle racing and tier, such as the PE8 and the Year 2. But we must consider that we exploited our knowledge of the coverage in terms of turret coverage of our opponents to make sure they could not fire back until the last moment meaning that our opponents had little time to exploit our weak overall durability and high flammability as we used the firepower of our 20mm cannon to bring them down accordingly. We then switched over to a limited capacity of boom and zoom, whereby we made sure to target foes who would not be aware of our encroaching presence and would fly in straight lines in front of us, with the two MiG-3s being the key examples here. This meant that our control surface lockup in a high speed dive was not going to hinder us, or at least in a very limited regard and then we finally switched over to the standard turn and burn style of play associated with the A6M2 Model 11 in order to pick up our final kills or final assists, and as a result, by using this overall versatility, we came second by comparison to the rest of our team. Now we could end this review here, but as part of our second gameplay, we are going to push the maneuverability of the A6M2 Model 11 to the limit and demonstrate what it can do in the midst of a furball and in the midst of a turn and burn scenario. So, let us get to it. For our final game of today then, we're on the frontline map Great River, using the same setup as before. Before we can go into our analysis of our overall maneuverability and our turn fighter characteristics, we need to talk about this plane's climb rate, as in my experience it is advisable to eliminate the threats up high before engaging in the furball. So, we start off at a spawn altitude of approximately 1,900 metres, and we're going to push towards 4,000 metres altitude. We shall see, as we go into our climb, in these short stint climbs, if you want to gain only 500 to 1000 meters altitude, the A6M2 falls behind its battle rating contemporaries, either the likes of the LA5, the Spitfire Mark IIb, and the Messerschmitt 19 ML and F. But if you're looking for a more sustained climb, i.e. one that takes a longer period of time, going from say 2000 to 4000 meters altitude, if not more, then this is the ideal plane. As whilst its initial climb rate is rather slow, this plane can sustain its climb much longer than anybody else, and the reason being it is a very light aircraft, has the great overall acceleration capability when it's war emergency power between your war emergency power stints, as depicted here, and the low stall speed of this aircraft of 95 km an hour with stall characteristics coming into play at 130 km an hour means that this plane can continue to climb for longer than any other fighter at its battle rating and tier whereby here we managed to get to 3,900 meters altitude and we are going to catch a P-47D Thunderbolt completely by surprise. 
Now one must assume in the midst of this cloud layer that neither of us knew that the other person was there. We heard the engine of the P-47 Thunderbolt and looked around to observe them. And we're coming up on their six here. And it looks as though they've been continuing to climb to the point where they're on the edge of their stall. Minute can get in close and put in a number of hits as they begin to turn across us and try to dive away. If we were flying any other aircraft here at our battery item tier, this would not have been possible or would have been very difficult to achieve. And we damaged the elevator on that P-47D as they dived down towards the deck. We also noticed how quickly we could just snap around on our foes there thanks to the fact our manoeuvrability is ideal within a speed range of 175 to 375 km an hour. Which means when going into the midst of a climb, in the midst of a cloud, if you suddenly come upon a foe, you can quickly manoeuvre onto them or manoeuvre out of their way in terms of their incoming fire. Whereby, as we're going to see shortly, this plane has the best turn circle for monoplane fighters on a tier and battle rating basis by comparison with its contemporaries. And as we begin to stall out, all we need to do is roll the plane 360 degrees as we put the nose down, and we'll be able to go into a gradual dive to build up our speed once again, and we can reinitiate our climb very quickly. Whereby our ideal starting speed for a climb is no more than 275 km an hour, unless you're going to extreme altitude in terms of above 5,000 meters. At that point, we need to get to roughly 350 km an hour before initiating the climb. And that is because this plane suffers at higher altitudes in terms of engine performance, especially above 5,500 meters altitude, where you'll struggle to build up your speed in terms of your straight line acceleration, and with your low top overall speed anyway, by comparison with planes such as the P-38 Lightning and the Messerschmitt Y9, you will find your foes trying to hit you and run away from you. But then you can climb after them as they try to loop over the top of you, and use your low stall speed to hit them whilst they're in the midst of their loop. This is a brilliant counter to the likes of the Messerschmitt Y9F and the P-38 Lightning in general. Now as we go into a dive here, we begin to attack a MiG-3. Again, applying our principle of attacking foes oblivious to our existence, who are in their own little world, and here the MiG-334 is just shooting at ground targets. We are going to get in close, managing our controllability here, making sure to predict their path, and open fire. Cutting them apart for what is our first kill. And we made sure to track that Messerschmitt 19 ml that was off to our left in the midst of the dive, and we latch onto them here, and pick them off for our second kill very quickly. We now carry our momentum through, and notice how we have not conserved our energy very well. I, we, our speed has dropped from roughly 650 km an hour at the start of that boom and zoom pass, to roughly 450 km an hour whereby the most gradual manoeuvres will bleed a good portion of our speed in the midst of a dive. And we latch on here to the P-39 in Aero Cobra, and we try to cut them apart. Notice that our rounds are not hitting, we provide a little bit more lead, and pick them apart for our third kill, before latching onto the tail of a MiG-3, who was initially pursuing or being pursued by a friendly Thunderbolt, and we knock them apart with our remaining cannon armament, or at least pick up a critical hit, and then use the accuracy of our nose-mounted machine guns here, getting in close, looking down the sight, and cutting them apart for another kill. With four kills now in the bag, we look around and see that the skies are empty around us. The only possible threat is an enemy Spitfire Mark IIA coming in gradually, firstly going for our friendly P-40 Kitty Hawk. We go for our reload on our 20mm cannon and get ready to react to the Spitfire, noticing that the P-40 has finally succumbed to their elevator damage, allowing us to pick up our ace in a day. We break ground here, cutting across the front of the Spitfires we're going to see. Using our best turn circle in class, by comparison with the other monoplane fighters at our battery item tier, to latch round onto the Spitfire Mark IIA and cut them apart for our sixth kill. What we should also note at this point in terms of our manoeuvrability, that in our ideal speed range of 175 to 375 km an hour, our rudder is as good as our turn circle, whereby if you turn this plane literally in a flat configuration, as depicted here, you can turn this plane as tightly on its rudder as you can when you do a standard turn. I roll in the plane 90 degrees clockwise or anti-clockwise and then pull it up on the elevator to initiate your turn. And here we're just looking at our opponents as they come across the battlefield, looking for the next furball to develop and the next opportunities to arise. And in the meantime we can build a little bit more altitude, using our sustained climb rate to our advantage. We notice a Wellington diving down to hit the ground targets, probably not able to see the frontline targets on the cloud layer. And we come around on our rudder here, showing the power of our rudder and how well this can bring our plane around. This means that when your elevator control service is knocked out, you can rely on your rudder in order to help you out. Or if the elevator is locked into the flat position, I where it's not negative or positive forces applied, and you only have the rudder to bring your plane around on target. Again, this emphasises the fact earlier that our control surfaces are very weak when they are hit, but we do have a number of control surfaces available in order to enable us to stay in the fight with limited capabilities. And here we continue to build our altitude and just scope out the scenario whereby we have a number of friendlies available now, and a number of enemies gradually coming onto the scene. 
And our final consideration point in terms of maneuverability is our roll rate, which is actually our weakest control surface in general, whereby our roll rate falls well behind the likes of the LA5, the LAG3 and the Focal 490 a one And typically it is very difficult once we've rolled 90 degrees one way to reverse our directionality on the roll by 180 degrees, uh, if we've rolled 90 degrees clockwise then roll 180 degrees clockwise to change our turn direction as the roll rate is rather slow. So once we commit to a direction of turn, we should ideally stick to it rather than try and change it. Although we can do so using a little bit of rudder correction as well. And here we dive down our Hurricane Mark 1 late, getting right onto their 6 and using our turn circle to stick right behind them here. Although we picked up a little bit too much speed in our initial dive, meaning we almost overshot the target. But we're staying right on their 6, a little bit too close for our convergence, and the Hurricane Pilot is providing a rather tough opponent. But we cut them apart on the left hand wing and latch onto an F6F-3 Hellcat here who cuts right across the front of us, and we just cut over the top via a loop, so you then cut over the top of us via a set of vertical scissors, and now we begin to make this more of a horizontal dogfight, we get onto the tail of the Hellcat, and begin to pile in the rounds. As they get to the distance, we finish them off through our remaining 20mm cannon rounds, and begin to break away once again, having picked up our 8th kill, and we sprinkle some rounds into the enemy Wellington here, just to do some damage. But notice straight away how, by not attacking the Wellington in a hidden position, i.e. where their turrets do not cover that position we took quite a lot of damage, whereby our left hand wing is quite damaged and our engine is started to take some damage. Now here we have a buffalo latching onto our 6 we cannot get away and we begin to turn across the front of them once again trying to force them to overshoot. It's an F2A-3 and they are rather manoeuvrable but we have the superior turn circle applying our combat flaps here and we cut them apart for another kill and pick up the assist on the Wellington. Now we begin to make our way away once again, and we can see a Junkers 87 off in the distance attacking one of our bases, but before we can go after them, we need to consider the Apache, either the A36 and the Hurricane both making their way towards us. We were expecting that our friendly fighters behind us, either the Bowfighter and the Spitfire, would be able to help out, but the Bowfighter has been knocked out by the enemy Hurricane, so it's time to get dirty. So we dive underneath the Apache here, and then cut over the front of them taking some grazing shots from their 12.7mm machine guns, and then we rinse and repeat for the Hurricane Mark IV, who is trying to get their 40mm cannon to bear on us. It's a 2v1 at this point, but it turns into a 1v1 thanks to the fact the Apache has broken away, a sensible decision. So we try to get a shot into the Hurricane here, making sure they do not climb for our friendly before we open fire, and we pick them apart for another kill. The Apache is now coming back in, we noticed on the radar, and we cut across them using the same tactic twice, this time breaking over the top of them via a loop, and then coming around very quickly onto them, and we try to hit them. But the Apache pilot proves, provides troublesome here, so we wait until they get to a longer distance and open fire. Our spray manages to clip them for a critical hit on their left aileron. They may crash eventually, or they're going to be a sitting duck to our friendlies who are in the vicinity. Now going for a reload here and experiencing a minor fuel link, thanks to the 12.7mm machine guns of the Apache, we are now going to go after a Yunkies 87. In level flight, what we can see again is that our overall acceleration, even at lower altitudes, is rather pale by comparison to that of our battery rating and tier contemporaries. And ideally, this plane does not perform as well in terms of its engine performance and straight line speed below a thousand meters altitude. And I would strongly recommend keeping this plane between one thousand and four and a half thousand meters altitude where possible, as this is where the engine will provide the greatest output. But then again, we are demonstrating here how you can go into the furball and turn fight with your opponents very successfully, even at ground level. And with the mission objective and knocking out the frontline ground units completed, we're going to try and go for our final kill on the Junkers 87 here. We want to get one last one and it is a D3. We decide to break away anyway in case it is a D5 who is trying to use their 20mm cannon armament to great effect, and we just literally break over the top of them, turning across them, making them wonder whether we're going to go head to head or turn with them. We latch onto their 6 here, picking up a critical hit on their tail control, and they're gone for the dust. We've picked up our 11th and final kill, and now we're just going to wait for the tickets to bleed as we keep our eyes open for incoming threats, such as this PE2 who we climb towards and then break out the way of even at our very low speed, as they're carrying a lot of speed and will not be able to react to our maneuverability at such tight intervals. As they turn across us here, we unfortunately cannot score any more hits as we run out of 20mm cannon ammunition, and the game comes to its end, and it is time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. With our 11 kills and single assist, we're able to pick up 32,820 silver lines and 1,781 research points. 
To defeat the A6M2 Model 11 then, I can recommend one main approach, and that is to engage it in a head-on pass. Reason being the 20mm cannon armament, the main armament of the A6M2, is based in the wings and is therefore convergence reliant. Tying this in with the fact that this plane is more of a typical turn fighter and therefore prides itself on close range engagements, and you would expect that the pilot would set their convergence to shorter distances, i.e. 400 meters or less, meaning that the 20mm cannon are going to be less effective at distances in excess of 600 meters as the cannon rounds begin to spread off a target. This means that planes with nose mounted 20mm cannon armaments, such as the Yakovlev Yak 1B and the Messerschmitt 19F1, and planes with large numbers of heavy machine guns set to longer convergence distances, such as the F6F 3 Hellcat, will be able to cut apart the A6M2 in that head on pass thanks to its low overall durability. And if you do happen to miss or only scratch the aircraft, you can always break past it and run off into the distance, as you will typically have the superior acceleration and superior top speed to get away and attack them again when you decide to do so. But by avoiding head-on passes today, and in this second game in particular, emphasising the turn fighter role for which the Zero in general is known for, we're able to come first to our comparison the rest of our team. So to conclude then, the A6M2 Model 11 ends up laying the foundations for the future A6M fighter aircraft that you will experience in the Imperial Japanese Naval Fighter line, whereby these planes will typically be associated with having great overall manoeuvrability for low overall durability, but at the same time great overall firepower, so long as you can bring it to bear at your convergence distance. But then again, do not forget that you do have some versatility, being able to use your great overall long distance climb rate, i.e. going up a large amount of altitude rather than in a short burst, in order to get up to altitude to act in a boom and zoom capability, or even be that bomber interceptor which your team needs. So I've been TX141, and if you've enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, take care and good luck in the skies.